um, there was a paper today in, in the morning by Zwiebern, and I'm, I had no time to read it. But at least I'll show you the abstract uh, at the end, which was uh, testing yet unpublished paper by Basar Stell and Hal. And I don't see any of them. Ah, oh, OK, good. So, but I had no time to read it. Anyway, I'll go with what I prepared. And in fact, we all were at Nikolai's test last, uh, Nikolai Fest last week, and uh, on which Tweeburn and Lance Dixon gave their talks. And there were much more details about it. Uh, but um, the speed with which they computed the loop graphs is really amazing. And so, uh, I'll tell you a few words about it. So, the, um, because what we see over the last, I don't know, five years, we see that the old counterterms, which were the basis for everybody to think that four dimensional supergravity is as bad as uh, pure gravity, uh, is a bit uh, shaky after this experience. And so, I'll try to explain my current understanding, which is, of course, much different from what it was before. And so the counterterms, which predict the infinities of the kind R to D4, D8, R to D4, etc., were constructed in something which was uh, known as on-shell supersymmetric candidate counterterms. And so what I was unable to do before, and so I'll report uh, here, is to make a clear difference between what is known as genuine supersymmetric and versus on-shell supersymmetric. And this also has to do with supergravity dualities, which uh, were part of the package uh, in attempts to understand the story. So my current understanding is that if we want to make genuine supersymmetric uh, counterterms, the theory must be deformed to the born infield type for extended supergravity. And of course, many people know that we don't know. We don't have these kind of models yet. And so what we actually did to prove the, um, the claim, we actually constructed explicit n equals two higher derivative born infield type supergravity, which was not known until very recently. And we see, because we know how this works in n equals two, we see how it is so difficult to do the same for n equals 4 up to n equals 8, where the uh, absence of UV divergences so far has been observed. And then uh, I'll go with wild conjecture on a hidden n equals 4 superconformal symmetry of n equals 4 supergravity. And I'll explain that it is easily and soon either falsifiable by the for loop computation or, on the contrary, supported. So let me first give you the list of new results. In 81, uh, I had a paper in House Tele Townsend. We have uh, written something which was known as um, a linear, uh, linear counterterm, a candidate counterterm for n equals a, d equals 4 supergravity. And it was um, the fact that we constructed it for n equals 8 was the expectation that it is likely to diverge at three loops. And the divergence will be R to D4, Riemann Christoffel tensor to the power 4. And so in 2007, there was a first miracle. Uh, and so there was a computation, which uh, was partially described yesterday by Henrik. And so Bern, Karaska, Dixon, Johansson, Kosova, Royban, first computation. Instead of having non-vanishing number, they got zero. They got the complete cancellation in front of this R to D4. And then in 2009, uh, Bassar, Howe, and Stelle uh, have constructed n equals a, d equals 5 supergravity. And they, say, they said that it is likely to diverge at four loops. Therefore, d6, r to d4 was expected to be uv divergence. And then there was a computation, which I call miracle number two. And so they, uh, almost the same group of people except Kassor, um, they found that uh, n equals 8, d equals 5 is free of divergences despite the existence of a candidate counterterm. This was number 2. And then there was number 3. Uh, and this, the, the speed was, con be the time between construction of new candidate counterterms 
and uh, actual computation <laughs> was making a huge progress. So half a year before computation, uh, the same group produced, uh, including Pierre Van Hoff, uh, counterterm, candidate counterterm for n equals 4d equals 4 supergravity, and they suggested that it is likely to diverge at three loops, uh, and it will be R2d4, and it took half a year, um, and there was this miracle number three, and n equals 4d equals 4 it turns out to be v free up to three loops. And this uh, was done by Bern Davis, Den and, and Huang, and they found the zero. And then it was the work by uh, Tur Tur Turkin and Van Hoff, and they did it using string theory, but in a slightly different model, with n equals four with matter. And the paper today, I w if I would have time, I would say miracle number four, because the counter term is not yet published, but the computation has been done. <laughs> And yeah, so um, we'll come to that. So something must be wrong. We don't know for sure what is wrong with this previous expectation that all these R2D4 have to be there. And so when the uh, loop computation will be done, we certainly will see it as we have seen from uh, Sanyoti that if we take pure gravity, R cube counter term was expected and the divergence was there. So there was a, like a mindset that if you have a counter term, then you do difficult computation and then you find some non-vanishing number. This, these three numbers are zero and the number today is one more zero, so number four. It was all based on something which was um, uh, using Brinkhau uh, on-shell superspace construction. And I did it and how Lindstrom, and it was uh, a long time ago. And the main point was that uh, if you use the on-shell symmetry, which means that you assume that all classical equation of motion are satisfied. And then you are able to construct uh, geometric invariants, and they start at L equals N loop level. So none of these fully geometric counterterms have been tested yet. All the uh, smaller loops computations still are not telling us about L, L equals N. Now, because on shell, there is a tensor calculus. There is an infinite proliferation of candidate counter terms, and it is not surprising that the theory is expected to be extremely bad. And for example, linearized start with um, R to D4, and so he here they are. Doesn't work. Okay, can you see if it can be fixed? Okay. So uh, the, the small comment things on miracle number uh, one is the following, that um, my, my first response was, we have seen all the counter terms only, thank you, in the covariant situation, but let's go to the light con super space, which is available in N equals eight. And there, my claim was that uh, back in 2009, that there are no candidate counter terms, and I gave reasonable arguments, and that predicted all loop finiteness. So when I was trying to understand what exactly was wrong with our previous story, each time I seemed to come up with um, that the explanation also uh, suggests that there will be more zeros. So the explicit calculation was done, as I told you, by this group. And they're working on five loops. So what exactly will happen in five loops, we don't know. And the, one of the explanations which I know was that um, the light con superspace counter terms are not available at any loop order. And this is still the case. And so uh, I talked to Lars Brink, who with his collaborators was working on this last week. And he told me he's still working, but the counter terms are still not available in the light con superspace. And this is very special for N equals A supergravity. They are off shell because the light con superspace by definition is off shell. And so in the beginning, uh, I as well as other people were just trying to construct them. And then I came up with the um, argument why they're not available. And I will, pos since this is not the main topic for me, I'll mostly talk about n equals four, Augusta, but the, so 
So the last word is they're not available as of today. So then other people were trying to explain the three loop finiteness. And there was a very good um, uh, set of papers about the role of E77 in N equals 8. And the claim was that because the three loop counter term breaks duality, uh, uh, this eventually leads to everybody's agreement that the finiteness should proceed up to seven loop. And so the dramatic part of n equals four three loop zero is that this argument doesn't work because for n equals four, l equals three, the counter term which was uh, constructed half a year ago uh, is duality invariant. So you can't, either you explain the n equals eight by saying duality is broken, but then it is not broken in n equals four. So you can't do both ways. And, and so at that time, uh, I uh, was discussing the issue of global uh, E7 at the three loop quantum correction. And I came up with understanding that something deeper seems to be happening that when we have this global duality, there is something called netter Gayarzumina current conservation. And, and it is inconsistent uh, when we add counter terms to the, when we deform the action. So then it was, this concept was revisited by Bosar Nikolai. And the nice part of it, yes, they agreed that if I have a counter term, then the current conservation is inconsistent unless I do something. And they made an assumption that it is possible to continue with this procedure of deformation of linear twisted self duality, and that will fix the problem. And this is actually uh, the main point. So with uh, Karaska and Royban, we revisited their proposal, and we have found that you can perform this deformation under certain condition, but even in case of simple born infill, this is a highly non-trivial procedure, and we worked out the details, and we had new UN examples. For example, we have uh, found a um, higher derivative uh, born infill at every order uh, recursively, and at that time, the point which was made, and I think was uh, accepted by, at least by Herman, that unless somebody puts on the desk an equal state born in full supergravity, the status of counter terms is, as a minimum, uncertain. And there were nice uh, attempts to understand issues with dualities in quantum theory, very recent, by Roy Ban, Zaitlin, Sorokin, Pastin, Tonin, Banster, and Heno, from their own perspective, because <coughs> E77 is just, uh, in the simplest version, is U1 duality. And the fact that you have uh, Maxwell field strengths on one hand, and the derivative of the action over Maxwell field strengths makes it non-trivial. Uh, the action, the, the symmetry knows what kind of an action is there, because you have to perform the variation to get the dual uh, connection part of the uh, duality multiplet. So it is a highly non-trivial situation, and I think we will know more about it. So this miracle number three was about n equals four supergravity. And this, it was really unexpected. So then if we use the current conservation as we did for E77, in n equals four, the duality is SL2R times SO6. And it works precisely this way. So if I have the R to D4, it breaks the current conservation. And therefore, I'm not totally surprised that uh, there is zero. And so uh, my proposal at that time was to revisit the old counter term paradigm, which was reinforced by n equals four computation. And so the story goes that electromagnetic duality symmetry, rotating Bianchi into vector field equations is always broken when supersymmetric duality invariant counter uh, quantum corrections are added to classical extended supergravity with something which we call type E7 groups to which this one belongs. So as of today, my best understanding that duality current conservation is only known, at least in the published paper, and, and so the explanation, the explanation is based on the netter current conservation, and um, the explanation which was given in many other papers that n equals eight uh, is three loop UV finite is just not working for n equals four. So something else has to be invented. But there was this whole cloud on the sky, which I described in my paper in particular, 
there was this old story of one loop global UN anomaly, which goes back to Di Vecchio, Ferrara, Girardella, and then Marcus. Uh, for n greater than four, uh, all supergravities are anomaly free. And the question was whether this global anomaly are relevant to three loop UV finiteness. And we have debates, and I hope we'll hear more uh, from Bussar and his talk. And so here I'll just tell you that I have a constant discussion of this issue with Roybon and Saitlin about the relation of uh, one loop uh, global anomaly and how it affects the on-shell amplitudes. And three amplitude vanishes on shell. We have found, uh, <laughs> this is unpublished, but the fact is we have found unusual non-local terms in the four-point amplitude related to Marcus anomaly, which are not present in an equal eight case. And so we were worried, we checked with Bern et al. that the three-loop finiteness, which they established for the four-point amplitudes, uh, is actually um, valid for any uh, four-point uh, legs. So it, was not, it is not looking that, like the anomaly affected their result. And so there were more recent discussion with Dixon and Bussar at Nikolai Fest. And so we have some disagreements and it should be sorted out soon. So since uh, Burn is not here, let me uh, show you what kind of computation they made, which we were described by Henrik yesterday, but he was mostly talking about n equals eight and this is half maximum n equals four. And so they used a double copy and they had basically 12 diagrams and here is what uh, the answer is. For the 12 diagrams, they look at UV divergence. And so they have this one over epsilon cube. Each set of diagrams have the bad terms, but they cancel. This is just fine. It was just checking that their answer is correct. Also, one, all one over epsilon squared cancel, but one over epsilon had the uh, zeta part and some numerical part and they all cancel. And so this is a statement that there is no um, R to D4 UV divergence at the three loop in N equal, pure N equals four supergravity. So this was kind of a checking things and this was a surprise, which was not expected at all by, by people. So then, um, many of you were working on supersymmetric black holes, you know, uh, some work I did with uh, Thomas Ortin, and we start using our experience with BPS black holes in n equals eight supergravity with regard to amplitudes, and we made an investigation which uh, uh, ended up by our claim that there is an abstraction to Bassar nuclear procedure of deformation of linear twisted self duality if we work in the framework of standard on shell superspace, which is too constrained to allow this deformation. So on-shell superspace was our conclusion, does not admit the kind of nonlinear deformation that would be required to incorporate the known candidate counter term in a way compatible with n equals eight and E7. And for people who know supersymmetry, the procedure of um, relaxing the constraint uh, means that you need 56 vectors instead of 28 without changing anything else. And supersymmetry just doesn't like to double vectors and not double anything else. And this is kind of an attempt to explain it simply, but there is a technical part in it. And so our conclusion was that to fix E7 duality, it is necessary to deform the superspace simultaneously with deformation of the linear uh, twisted self duality. And the jury is still out, it has not been done and the fact is you just can't do it keeping the standard uh, superspace. So then uh, we decided to go low level to n equals two where we know many things. And so I'll try to explain what for me today is the problem with on-shell supersymmetry. So as you know, this is a local supersymmetry. So the statement that the classical action is invariant under local transformation requires that the equation of motion are not um, used because then it is always zero. So you really have to find, establish the symmetry, the local symmetry, not using equation of motion. And this is, I think, the major problem with on-shell superspace. So the counterterms on the country, they have local supersymmetry, 
only when classical supersymmetry transformations are satisfied. So this is a status. All non counter terms. Uh, the variation is proportional to the derivative of the action over some fields times the variation. But this is zero conditionally, only under this condition. And it was never um, investigated whether it means that they have genuine su local supersymmetry or not. It was simply too complicated. And we were happy to have at least on-shell counterterms. And so the question is, if the, is this difference relevance? What does it mean for higher derivative superinvariant to be genuine versus on shell? So we decided to use this laboratory of n equals two, which was known from a long time by Fratkin and Vasilev, that n equals two has um, uh, auxiliary fields. And so I'll shortly tell you about my recent work with Chimisani, Ferrara, and Shakhbasi. Uh, so we started with Bernard, David, and collaborators n equals 2 super conformal R2D4. This one is genuine. It is supersymmetric, doesn't require any condition. So what we added to their construction, which was highly non-trivial, this is why it was not known. Uh, so we had to gauge fix to super Poincaré in presence of higher derivative action. That was not easy. Then we had to eliminate auxiliary fields, and that was not easy either. And then we had to compare with on-shell counterterm. When all of this has been done and all dust settled, uh, this is where we are with equals two, where we do have genuine uh, counterterm. So we have an action which, for those of you who know the superconformal calculus n equals two, will tell something. Otherwise, you just have to look at this as follows. This is the compensating chiral superfield, and this is the vial multiplet. And there is a well-known procedure, and you can, you can get uh, extremely complicated answers. So what we did, we took the simplest prepotential, just so that we have pure n equals 4 supergravity and the simplest possible generalized Keller potential. And the tools are, S is a chiral compensator superfield, W is a vial superfield, and gauge fixing requires a choice of the second compensator, which we take to be off-shell nonlinear vector multiplier. Fortunately, it is also off-shell. And for experts, we couldn't use the standard hyper as a second compensator because we really had to see everything off-shell. So that was tricky. And we got an action, which in particular, this is the still superconformal action, which has a second compensator. The details are not important. What is, however, important that there is an issue of the gravity photon, which is the only vector which appears in the on-shell superspace. And it, it is, after all the extra superconformal symmetries are gauge fixed, what you see in this action, it is linear, in, uh, linear and quadratic in auxiliary field from the vial multiplet. And it also depends on the uh, F component of the compensator. So classically, if I don't have anything but Einstein theory, uh, the auxiliary field is basically the gravity photon. But what happens? Here's the action. What a mess. Even in simplest case, with our choice, where the corresponding chiral superfield is the ratio of uh, vial multiplet by uh, first compensator, uh, we do have this answer gives us the full information about the n equals to superconformal cartic power of the vial multiplet divided by the uh, corresponding um, power of compensators. And so we had to do a lot of work to fill in all the components for the tensor calculus for this particular choice. And as you see, this is a rather complicated uh, story, but the story which uh, actually Ferrara had before we did any computation, his understanding was that because at the linear of superconformal symmetry, Kartik vial multiplet, uh, sorry, Kartik vial tensor has a partner, this, uh, this um, uh, auxiliary field from the vial multiplet. It means that when we start solving classical equation with deformation R to D4 or C to D4, the value of uh, this auxiliary field 
apart from being linear in gravity photon, will have higher, uh, higher powers of auxiliary field. And you see, when you start solving this by recursion, the deformation absolutely requires that the auxiliary field has terms linear in F, um, gravity photon cubic, uh, five power five, et cetera, et cetera, nonstop. And this is um, where you find that when you eliminate the auxiliary field, you get bone infill type higher derivative in vectors in the action. And so this green term shows that the on-shell counter terms don't have these terms. And this is new. And then the beautiful part about uh, superconformal symmetry, there is, there is Q and special supersymmetry. So there are 16 plus 16 of them. I think we have seen this kind uh, yesterday in Zafferoni's talk. So here it is necessary to gauge fix the special supersymmetry, uh, preserving the gauge. And so what happens that the parameter of special supersymmetry becomes a functional of Q supersymmetry and the resulting supersymmetry of supergravity is given by the following expression. So first of all, there is this term which reproduces uh, the antiformed gravitino transformation. And then there is a lot, a lot of terms here. And the main point was, uh, will we be able to prove that something survives? Because this is so complicated. When you deal with supersymmetry and something is messy, it doesn't mean that it is not zero. So our main work was uh, dedicated to, uh, to check, and this was done using the gamma uh, matrix structure and the SU2 structure, and the main point was we have established that there are new terms in gravitino transformation that the deformation of superspace has to be done to have genuine supersymmetry, and so this was a new statement. And to tell you how complicated it was, those are auxiliary fields from the Val multiplet, from the chiral compensator, and from the nonlinear vector multiplet. So uh, in the beginning, it was looking we will never be able to make a coherent statement. But after some significant amount of work, uh, what was confirmed that the fact that at the first approximation, we have to solve this recursion relation actually survives the whole procedure of eliminating all of those uh, auxiliary fields. And therefore, the claim is that we have to do the deformation. So in the past, it was possible to say that the on-shell superspace um, uh, is, is difficult. So let's not even do it. And let's wait till uh, I call these people computer geeks just to relax. And they will do the computation. Then we will decide what is our next step. And, uh, but be because we have these new facts here, that N equals 4, 3 loop was established, that explicit deformation of N equals 2 on shell superspace in its component form to match the genuine superspace is now established. The difference is not vanishing. So you have to do the deformation. And the question is, can you do it or not? So how to establish the existence or non-existence order by order deformation, we know how it works in n equals two. And so the program is now highly motivated and it actually matches the difficulty of the four loop computation which have been done by this team working on three loop computation and they are now running the four loop. So this is just for fun. When I showed this picture at a Nikolai test, these two people were there, and they insisted that first they use gray cells and only then the silicon, but they use a lot of it. And this is the uh, extremely complicated program, problem. So unless you really first use your gray cells and then computer, there is no way to get the conclusive answers. Anyway, so uh, uh, to summarize this part of the talk, we have found that if you want a true supersymmetric counter term, you have extras in n equals 2, and we don't know how to get them in n equals 4 and n equals 8. And something has to be done. Because the available one are not under truncation to n equals 2, they do not go in the correct expressions. So I'll skip this. And um, so to repeat, performing a consistent order by order deformation of n equals 8 on shell superspace may be not much easier than computing the UV divergences in higher loop amplitudes. 
and this is my current understanding. Um, so there are two points of view, and those are that the legitimate D equals four counter terms are not available yet because we were not able to con contract, construct them, or they're not available period because they do not exist. And we still have to find out what is there. And I think one of the earliest hints will be um, burn computation of n equals four, loop number four. So if some of these high loop divergences will, be, will show up, uh, they were predicted in 81. And uh, I would like to stress that the one which are geometric uh, they start at n equals, equal, n equals 4, l equals 4, uh, and n equals 8, l equals 8. They have not been tested yet. So this first computation may be quite crucial. It may just close the door. Still, we will be left with a puzzle why we have all these um, uh, zeros. To claim the BPS protection is difficult because certain BPS counterterms actually did show up in higher dimensions. And so this is something we will learn soon, and I hope uh, we'll le learn more. So, but I would say there are 50% chance that they will find UV divergence at loop number four, and 50% they will not, simply because we don't know what the answer is. So let's talk about this other 50%. Because if they find, they we just will probably forget about the whole story and start doing other things. But so if they find more zeros. I consider this as an opportunity to te test some new ideas. I told you about the light cone. The challenge is, please construct a counter term. Anybody? I told you about duality netter current conservation prediction, and it is unusual and still there. I told you about the general universes on shell supersymmetry. This is new, and now I We'll start, I, I go into more speculative suggestion, which is a very recent paper about hidden symmetry of supergravity. Of course, we would like to see something which is hidden. And one possibility, which is based on recent paper with Ferrari and Van Proen, is the conjecture, which everybody in supergravity knows that it was always a tool. Superconformal symmetry was always a tool. It was easier to use the tensor calculus. You construct superconformal theory first, then you gauge fix it and you get supergravity. Now, uh, Tuan Van Proen, who was one of the uh, people doing all of this, he thought it will always stay like that, it will be just a tool. However, uh, with our recent study of uh, possibility that it's actually more than a tool, uh, and with understanding that we have not found any contradictions so far in this conjecture, and so the, we know what to do to actually invalidate the conjecture. We will be working on this in parallel with Bern um, computing loop number four. So the idea is that if we start at the superconformal level, uh, what we have is a unitary gauge. And in the unitary gauge, it is difficult to see good UV properties, as we learned a long time ago about the standard model. The analogy is that if we take uh, unitary gauge in standard model, we see MW and MZ, and they give you an impression that they are fundamental parameters, but then we go to toothed attitude, we ungauge fix certain symmetries, and those don't appear anymore. And so what was crucial for standard model is the absence of local anomalies, which was showing that there is an equivalence between on-shell amplitudes and only on-shell amplitudes, which could have this nice property in some other class of gauges versus the unitary gauge, where it is extremely difficult to see the, uh, unitarity, uh, the, the good UV properties. So the question is, can we treat n equals 4 Poincaré as a unitary gauge of n equals 4 superconformal? And would it help us to explain the absence of divergences? Thanks. Very good. I just need this. So again, because um, I stress that this is the conjecture uh, which will be um, um, verified at the level of L equals 4, N equals 4, D equals 4 supergravity. If it is still finite, it will support the conjecture. If it will um, be uh, UV infinite, it will 
support uh, falsify the conjecture. So we we will have to wait, and meanwhile we'll try to kill it ourselves if we can. The last I have heard from Bernard David, who was during the four days at nuclear test asking various questions, his um, attitude was, "I can't confirm, and I can I can't invalidate the conjecture," which for, for now is good enough, and we will have to work more to to understand it. So. I'll try to, uh, and I believe it is a lot at stake here, because if this is really the reason for, for the zeros in n equals 4 theory, there is an easy way to connect all this to those zeros in higher uh, extended n, which I'll not uh, uh, spend my time now. So, you can tell me, who should ever trust local vial symmetry? Isn't it always anomalous? And as you know, in it, so th there is an action which has six wrong sign vector compensator multiplets, and it has vial symmetry, special supersymmetry, K, local supersymmetry, local SU8, and local U1. Lots of additional symmetries which all have to be gauge fixed to get N equals 4 point array supergravity. And our understanding, it has an extremely good chance to be free of N equals 4 superconformal local anomalies which was the main context of the study, and provide a reason for this computation which has been already done. So what, what is there? It's a simple model. It has a vial multiplet with off-shell algebra, which has a local Q and S supersymmetry. And there is a Maxwell matter multiplet where the algebra is closed only on shell. And because the actual action is invariant when you perform simultaneously the transformation of the vial multiplet and the maximal multiplet, it has a significant difference with every other model which is only known on shell because the vial is already, uh, uh, the, the symmetries are fixed and they form the algebra. So this is a very special case. It all goes back to early work in 80s of these people. And uh, let me just, um, tell you what the vial compensator concept is. So we can start with the wrong sign kinetic term for an extra scalar. This is a toy model. And this action you can easily see is invariant under local vial symmetry. You rescale the metric, you rescale the compensator. And because you have local symmetry, you can gauge fix it and you are back to um, Einstein gravity. So for n equals zero, it is so easy to write the uh, R2D4. You just take the Kartik vial tensor and divide by the scalar field. No problem, because the symmetry is spontaneously broken. You can always divide. And so you, you don't get anything useful when you use um, a superconformal symmetry for low n. For n equals two, I just showed you, no problem. Here, here it is. It is a mess, but it is a mess which follows from the rule. There is a tensor calculus, superconformal, and yes, we know how to divide the vial multiplet by the compensator multiplet. And we always have to divide uh, going to higher and higher derivatives. Now, in n equals 4, because we just exercised how things work in n equals 2, our conclusion was either we were unable to construct or it's just not there. And so we tend to say it may be not there. So what the theory is, is quite beautiful. This is the bosonic part of the whole story. And I'll not go into details. If the next computation will give us a zero, I think many people may want to start with this action. If not, <laughs> sorry, I took your time. So the classical superconformal action after gauge fixing, vial symmetry, local SU4, uh, local U1, S supersymmetry, and K conformal boost. This was a tricky story. Good things. So here we have a, a, a maximum multiplet, and we have some other scalars to gauge fix. The procedure is complicated. It was very interesting that the only way the supergravity was derived in the past from superconformal was to give a rather complicated version of n equals 4 theory. We have found a new gauge, which was based on some triangular decomposition 
of SL2 are, in this new gauge, you get from superconformal action directly the nicest version of N equals 4, which is Cremer, Scherk, Ferrara, which many string theorists also like because it has immediately this modular parameter, an extremely simple interaction between tau and uh, Fs. So there was simultaneously the same day as ours published paper by Zaitlin and um, his uh, collaborators. What they did, they have integrated this um, vector multiplet interacting with the vial multiplet. And if for the first time, the answer represent the uh, C squared, the full nonlinear expression, which was not available. And for us, it was important because in our paper, we needed it to make a connection with the fact that uh, in the past, Fischler did the computation, and if the corresponding gauge fixed theory has matter, there are one loop divergences. And it was necessary for us to match all of these, and thanks to this computation, it was possible. So the argument goes like that. There's only one type of possible matter multiplets in n equals 4 supersymmetry, and this is the Maxwell multiplet, which has a particular vial weight. And it is not possible to construct n equals 4 superconformal version of C4 of the kind which we were able to make just recently in n equals 2. So this is, a, uh, I showed you a few times, this is, if I want C4 divided by phi to D4, I know how to make it n equals 2. And when I want to do the same in n equals 4, here is a big question mark, and our claim is it is not available as of today. And we're going to work hard and see if it is not available at all. And the reason is that the algebra is closed on the vial multiplet and open only on compensator. And this is a very special feature. So the n equals 2 superconformal calculus allows to use any function of chiral compensator for building new superinvariants. And this is why in n equals 2 we were able to make it, and in n equals 4 this is absent. So in n equals 2, you can take any function of a chiral multiplet, and you know how to build uh, invariant actions, not in n equals 4. So uh, anomalies, that was the most interesting story. So Marcus, in his own paper about composite anomalies, he says, aside from the issue of dynamical gauges, it is unclear what, if any, is the significance of these anomalies, and I hope we'll hear more from Guillaume. But for me, in the context of superconformal, it was important to understand what is known about local anomalies, because local anomalies could be fatal. So that you can't prove unitarity in the gauge where you see good UV behavior and vice versa. So then local anomalies are based on the following. We compute the S matrix in a certain gauge characterized by two parameters, and it has to be equal the physical observables only to the S matrix computed in a changed gauge. And for this, you have to have the absence of anomalies. And this is a complicated expression. Just believe me, it is this A, which we have to either have or not have. And it turns out that in this particular case, either you compute the coefficient in front of this expression, or this expression, like in case of orthogonal group, doesn't exist. And so we went back into various previous studies done by David and Grisaru a long time ago with regard to n equals 1 superconformal, and much more recently by Schwimmer and Tyson. And some of you may have seen this formula. Because I, will, I have no time, I'll just skip it. There was a discrepancy between those two. And we found that we have to follow this prescription. And then the conclusion, our conclusion was, I'll just go quickly, that we have to build new invariants using log phi, which we can do in n equals 2, and we can't do in n equals 4. OK. So this is the main point, and I'm coming to the um, almost end. So to build a local consistent anomaly, we need to build invariants using log phi, and to build counter term, we need to use negative powers of Five. So it is the same, just one conjecture. We can't do it. And there are again two possibilities. Either they are not available because we have not found them, or they are just not available, period. And we will know soon more. 
So this is the conclusion. Our conjecture on local n equals 4 superconformal symmetry underlying n equals 4 supergravity is the simplest today possible explanation of three loop finiteness predicts perturbative UV finiteness at higher loop. Therefore, loop number 4 will be crucial. The same conjecture applies to higher derivative uh, and therefore it is economical. It is sparing in the use of resources. Either this local uh, superconformal is a good symmetry or it is not. It is falsifiable and in fact they are working on this computation right now. And so if the conjecture will survive the four loop n equals four supergravity computation, if it will be refined, it will give us a hint that the models with superconformal symmetry without dimensional parameters may serve as a basis for constructing a consistent quantum gravity where M Planck appears in the process of gauge fixing spontaneously broken while symmetry. This is an extremely ambitious um, proposal, and, but it is falsifiable. So why not try? So just for fun, um, this picture is uh, 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 showing uh, the recent work of Lipatov and collaborators of double logarithms in Einstein-Hilbert gravity and supergravity. Uh, so n equals 4 has this strange flat behavior. And I leave you with this puzzle, which reminds you my story about the superconformal symmetry. And finally, the today's paper, which I had no time to read, and I hope we'll hear more, seem to say that there is one more miracle because uh, Bern et al. computed um, the five loop, two loop, sorry, four point divergence in D equals five half maximal supergravity, which is n equals four. And there is a valid counter term satisfying the known symmetries. Uh, this is a paper which uh, will present the counter term, but they already found zero, even before the candidate counter term was published. This will, was my understanding, but again, I didn't have enough time. So if this is the case, it will be number four and probably will tell us additional story. And I just want to leave you with this um, uh, feeling that this is a very rapidly developing and very interesting story. Thank you. <laughs>